Okay, so electrolyte concentration. We have to make sure that we account for charge and also the, the, the mass or the quantity of the molecules. And so we're going to use this form of measurement called an equivalent. And I'm going to basically start here with what this definition or a working definition of an equivalent. So an equivalent is going to be the amount of whatever you're measuring. So if it's sodium, then it would be the amount of sodium. If it's potassium, then it's the amount of potassium, or the amount of calcium, or the amount of chloride, or whatever it is. The amount of that particular particle that would neutralize one mole of either the positively charged hydrogen ion or the negatively charged hydroxide ion. Okay? Probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we're gonna we're gonna break this down and hopefully make sense of it. So how much of sodium or how much potassium or how much calcium or magnesium would we need to neutralize a single mole of hydroxide? And when I say neutralize, I mean how many positive charges here do I need to neutralize the negative charge here? So one mole of hydrogen or one mole of hydroxide. Does anyone happen to know how many molecules that would contain? Okay, so we're pretty close. What's what's the number? What's the ten? Ten. 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 So a mole of anything contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Now what does that mean? It means that we moved the decimal place in 6.02, 23 places to the right. So it would be 6020000 followed by 23 zeros. That's a huge number. That's the number of molecules, individual molecules, that are in one mole of a substance. Now, when we're talking about electrolytes, we can also say that this is related to the number of charges that would be present. So we would have the same number of charges. Now, how am I getting that? Because a mole of hydrogen is going to have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of hydrogen that each contain a single charge. That single charge is going to be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd charges. Same goes for the hydroxide, except for it's just negative instead of positive. All right. Now let's consider one mole of sodium. How many molecules and how many charges? Six point oh two times ten to the twenty third. Because it's a mole. Remember, this is what designates six point zero two times ten to the twenty third. So this one mole of sodium is going to have six point whoa. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules and charges. So, remember our definition, we want to try to neutralize a hydroxide ion. If I have one mole of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd charges and I have sodium positive there, I need 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd negative charges from my hydroxide to neutralize them, right? 
one for one, one positive, one negative neutralizes. So if I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd positive charges, I'm going to need 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd negative charges to neutralize. Does that make sense? This is the definition of one equivalent. And if we take that one equivalent, or my one mole of sodium, and I put it into water, I would have one equivalent per liter. Now, this is also that one equivalent per liter for sodium would also be one mole per liter. Right? Because it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So that's pretty easy, right? Well, let's try this shoe on and see how it fits. Which, by the way, I'm a strong supporter that if you're ever going to criticize anybody, you should walk a mile in their shoes first. So that you have their shoes and you're a mile away. <laughs> Some of you are going to get that a little bit later. Diane was funny. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to pass this class? You will think that it's funny. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> One mole of calcium. How many molecules? How many molecules? Okay, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. But, how many charges? Two times. two times, right? Because I have two charges for each individual molecule of calcium. So rather than being 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, I'm going to have two times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd charges from my single mole of calcium. Charges, so, uh, moles, molecules, molecules. So calcium, a mole of calcium contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, but two times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd charges. So if we're going to just simply use molarity in moles, the effects of one mole of calcium would actually be it would be twice as twice as much charge as a mole of sodium. So we have to account for that. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, each molecule of calcium, Ca2+, adds two charges. So now, I'm trying to neutralize 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd hydroxide ions. I only need half as much calcium, right? Because each calcium molecule is adding in two. Whereas sodium was only adding in one, so it was one for one. This is now two for one. So what that means is I am only going to need 0.5 moles of calcium to neutralize. And that's going to be my one mole of my negatively charged ion, my hydroxide ion. So kind of bring this home, bring it all back to equivalent. We already know that one mole of sodium equals one equivalent, right? Because that's what we Defined. So, one mole of calcium with its plus two charges, how many equivalents do you think that's going to be? It's going to be two equivalents. So, two equivalents, and then if we put it in water, it would be two equivalents per liter. So the, this is kind of the long story, right? What's the really easy way to do this? It's to take your charge, 
and just drop it down. So if we had something that had, I don't know, three charges, maybe it's PO4 3 minus, the phosphate ion. A mole of phosphate ion is going to be three equivalents per liter. Now an equivalent and a mole, a mole is a really big measure. Equivalent is a really big measure. And we don't ever use that in terms of cell physiology because we don't have those types of volumes. We don't have, we're not dealing with a liter when we're dealing with a cell. We're dealing with microliters and nanoliters, right? So rather than using the full equivalent, electrolyte concentrations are low. So electrolytes have low concentrations. And to account for those low concentrations, we're going to use a measurement called a milli equivalent. Now, in terms of milli equivalent, rather than being moles, we're going to use millimoles. So one millimole of a singly charged ion A milli equivalent, so one millimole of a charged ion is going to equal one milli equivalent. How about if we have calcium with plus two charge? How many milli equivalents? Two milli equivalents. So what you're looking at here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ions. And those eight different ions are at different levels or different equivalencies inside and outside of the cell. In the cell, intracellular fluid. Outside of the cell, extracellular fluid. So sodium has 142 milliequivalents per liter outside of the cell and 10 milliequivalents per liter inside of the cell. You're going to run into these numbers. And... It's going to be important, especially for nurses and clinicians, to know these numbers. So put them in your brain bank now. In my world, in dealing with physiology, really what I want you to know is which one is higher, which one is lower. And so as we start to talk about certain physiological systems, I'm going to model it with a cell membrane, which I'll draw as a double line. So that's my cell membrane. I'm going to mark my extracellular fluid and I'm going to mark my intracellular fluid. Maybe we're going to talk about sodium potassium pumps. No, let's, let's talk about a sodium channel. So maybe I'll draw in a sodium channel. And this sodium channel is going to open up the cell membrane to become permeable to sodium. How is sodium going to travel? You already can tell me. Because we know that sodium is at very high concentration. It's intentional that I just I didn't just have a seizure, right? Do it big on purpose. Sodium on the outside is a very high, 142 milliequivalents per liter, and on the inside, a very low, 10 milliequivalents per liter. Now, the cell becomes permeable to sodium through that sodium channel. How is sodium going to move? It's going to diffuse into the cell. Okay. So get to know these numbers, and for my purposes be able to set up a cell around a membrane. These are my negative anions in the cell and overall negative charge, things like uh, DNA and proteins. High level of potassium inside the cell, low level of potassium outside the cell, and reverse for sodium. Is that chart in the book? Um, it might be in the book. If not, just type in, um, you can Google electrolyte concentration in the cell, and you should be able to get that chart. I think it's in the book someplace. I think I've read it. I don't see it in the chat, please, but I don't use it. All living systems, you remember back to last week we talked about definition for living system and we knew or we defined a living system um, as requiring energy. 
energy input, right? Okay, so we need to know a little bit about energy. Again, this is my abbreviation for energy, NRG. And energy, we're just going to classically define this as the ability to do or perform work. Is this a big six? Or like yeah. So the ability to do or perform work. Now, inside of all of our cells, we store up energy as a molecule called ATP. And in a lot of cases, ATP is considered to be the currency uh, or the energy currency of biological systems. Basically currency because this is what we pay all of the work that we need to do. This is how we pay for it. We use ATP up. We're going to burn ATP to generate energy. Now, why ATP? Well, there's a really good reason for ATP. And that reason comes down to the types of energy that exist on the planet. They are potential energy, which is free or stored energy that is ready for work. Okay? So potential energy is going to be stored up energy. So, you know, last semester, uh, when I jumped up on the table, I was talking about the same thing. You weren't there. So I got up on the table. Everybody keep your phones ready. So I get up off on the table, and I just totally changed my mind. But it's stored right now, right? <laughs> it's just got totally sketchy. So my energy is different when I'm up here than when I'm down on the floor, right? And right now it's stored. It's stored based off of my position. So if you were to, I don't know, put a mouse on the floor and I were to jump off the table right now, I, I'd squash it. But if the mouse was on the floor when I was on the floor, I wouldn't have the ability because they don't have the same stored up potential energy. So based off of the position, whether I'm close to the... The ceiling or close to the floor is going to change the type of energy that <laughs> the type of potential energy I'm, I'm storing. When I get down, I'm hoping not to die. <laughs> but when I get down, there's going to be a transition of my, my position from my top of the table to the to the floor. And as I get down, I'm actually going to be moving. And that means that the energy is actually going to be released from its store from its storage site. <laughs> so I just released all of that energy. My heart's racing. <laughs> <laughs> and on the way down, I went from being on top of the table to being on the floor. The difference in the potential energy here versus my potential energy now on the floor is called kinetic energy. That difference in position in the two positions, and it's energy that was used to do work. It was energy used to bring me back down to the floor. So potential energy is the free or the stored energy in a system. The kinetic energy is the energy of motion or of movement. This is the energy of work. So this is the type of energy we have when we are working. Things like electrolytes moving through gated protein channels across the membrane would be an example of kinetic energy. Wouldn't it have been awesome if I just like totally did backflip right off the table and just <laughs> stuck the landing? <laughs> no, yeah, I did about halfway or how I just land right on my back. <laughs> Glass is over. <laughs> Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> so, why the ATP molecule? Well, what you can see out here is I have these three groups here centered around a phosphorus molecule. The bond that is formed here between the phosphorus and the oxygen in each of these each of these pairs holds a lot of potential energy. So, if I can take the electrons that are stored up in this particular bond here 
and I can break them and reposition those electrons, the old position and the new position are going to be different, just like jumping off of the table. The difference is the kinetic energy, and there's a lot of kinetic energy that's stored up, in particular, this third bond in ATP. So when I go from ATP to ADP, there's a difference in the electron position, and there's a difference that, or that difference is exhibited as uh, kinetic energy. We're going to wind back around to this. Let me go ahead and clear this out. I'll go back up to the top of the page. So we're going to come back around on that. But before we can do that, before we can really kind of wrap everything up, we need to know just a little bit about organic chemistry. No. No. OK, if I can summarize. Organic chem chemistry in just a few simple terms, carbon is promiscuous. Carbon has a lot of different bonding partners. It becomes a central molecule for building a variety of different types of chemical structures. And that's why organic chemistry and biology go hand in hand because biology requires a lot of different chemical structures for living systems. So organic chemistry just simply is centered on this molecule called carbon. And here is just some interesting organic molecules. And literally there are thousands and thousands of others. And you will notice that the unifying feature in all of these molecules is carbon. So why carbon? Carbon contains four valence electrons. And so what that means, because carbon contains four valence electrons, is there is a number of different bonds that can be formed with a single molecule of carbon. We can actually form up to four individual covalent bonds <coughs> from a single atom of carbon. So this helps us to increase things like molecular, let's try that again, molecular, Euler diversity. We're not just binding carbon to one other atom. We can bind carbon up to oxygen and nitrogen. We can bind carbon up to hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and another carbon. And all of these different atoms can all be bound up, increasing the seemingly endless possibilities of carbon-based molecules that can be produced. In one place in particular where this becomes really important for biology we can create things called chemical backbones. So chemical backbones become possible. And what I mean by a chemical backbone is I can bond a series of carbons together and I can form things like chains of carbons or branches of carbon molecules or rings of carbon molecules. And each of these chains or branches or ring structures brings new function to the system. But I can take it a step further. It's not just about making the chains or branches or ring structures. I can now begin to add in functional groups. So carbon can be bound up to functional groups. Figure 2.4, 2.4 in your book. He's going to show a variety of those functional groups. These include things like carboxyl groups and carbonyl groups and uh, amine groups and hydroxyl groups. And every time I add a functional group to a carbon molecule, I slightly change the function. Okay. It, it was table 2.4 or figure 2.4. I'm not sure what. 2.4. 2.14. I'm sorry. 2.14.
I just to kind of highlight all of this, the chains, the branches, the rings, the bonded functional groups that change function. Check out right up here, estrogen and testosterone. What's the difference? If you look at these two molecules, what's the difference? We have fun some functional groups that are a little bit different here. We have another carbon that gets bonded on here. A couple differences up here with some of the functional groups that are present. We have double bond over here where we don't over here. Testosterone and estradiol really are not all that different in appearance, but functionally are massive. And it's all about the carbon and what carbon can actually achieve. All right, in terms of organic <coughs> chemistry, there are two chemical reactions that are extremely important. Now, there are more than just two organic chemistry reactions. But that's chemistry, not biology. You need to know two. You don't need to know 92 elements. You need to know six. You don't need to know 100 reactions. You need to know two types. In those two types of reactions, the first one is a dehydration synthesis reaction. In a dehydration synthesis reaction, we have a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen group that are going to be the base for reaction. So these are going to react. Our negatively charged hydroxyl group, our positively charged hydrogen are going to react. Now, what you should see in there with an OH and its H, add up the H's, add up the O's, you get H2O. So the two molecules that are reacting, and I'm going to come back over to this figure here in just a minute. This is the dehydration synthesis reaction. The two molecules that are reacting, they are being put together, synthesis, and they are losing water, hydration or dehydration. So at the end of the dehydration reaction, we form a molecule of water. That's the dehydration and then a covalent bond between individual atoms. Most commonly, it's going to be carbons and oxygens. So I have glucose and I have fructose. And you can see I have a free hydrogen in the glucose, and I have a hydroxyl group uh, attached up to one of the carbons on the fructose. Count up the hydrogens, count up the oxygens, I get H2O. They come together to lose the water, dehydrate the water from the glucose and the fructose, and now I've formed carbon-oxygen-carbon -carbon bond. Okay? You are going to see dehydration reactions all over biology. You're going to see dehydration reactions when we build proteins. You're going to see dehydration reactions when we put together nucleotide chains of DNA and RNA. You're going to see hydration reactions when we build up glycogen and store it in the liver. So the dehydration reaction is, is all over. Now, what do you think the other reaction is going to be? How about the opposite of a dehydration reaction? And we're going to call that a hydrolysis reaction. And hydrolysis literally means hydro water and lysis break. So break with water. So we are going to reverse our dehydration reaction, and we're going to put the water back in. So reverse of dehydration synthesis, and we're going to use a molecule of water to provide our hydrogen and our hydroxide. And when we do that, we are going to use the hydrogen and the hydroxide to split two monomers or two parts of a substance to split them apart. So I got a picture of a hydrolysis reaction here. You can actually see that it's the reverse of the dehydration reaction I just showed you. 
So when glucose and fructose are put together and covalently bonded together, we form this disaccharide called sucrose. When we add in some water, and in this case we're going to add in this enzyme called sucrase, how else could we do this? How else could we call this, cause this reaction to go? Don't have to necessarily catalyze it with an enzyme. That's all I got to do within a biological system, but what about in the lab? What could I do in the lab? What's that? Yeah, add heat. So add some water and add some an enzyme, or add water and add some heat, and the reaction is going to go in the reverse direction where that water is used to break that bond to form my glucose and my fructose. By the way, don't know if you know this yet or not, but how, how did I know that sucrase was an enzyme? ASE. -E. You always are going to see ASE at the end of the name of an enzyme. So if I give you a molecule and I say, yeah, hexokinase, you instantly know that it's an enzyme. What about aldolose? Oh, yes. It's a sugar. Good. So we got some of that. That's good. <coughs> two monomers. So two individual parts of a bigger molecule could be broken apart. So I'm not going to go over much of the rest of organic chemistry that you've already learned. But I think it might be wise to take a little time, maybe an hour or two while you're studying this week, to review organic molecules. And you can do so on your own in the, with the book or uh, maybe your old chemistry book, perhaps. But what are the organic molecules that we need to know about? There are four of them. What was that? Okay, we're going to call those carbohydrates or saccharides. Lipids. Proteins or amino acids. What's in the middle of the nucleus? DNA and RNA, these are nucleotides. So carbohydrates or saccharides is one. Lipids. Proteins, amino acids, and then nucleotides. So take some time to review those organic molecules. What I want to do here, and we're looking at about 20 minutes left. Let's talk briefly about enzymes. So here you have a picture, you can see hexokinase is the enzyme, and what it's doing is it is going to take glucose and ATP, going to bind both glucose and ATP, and we're going to end up with a product called glucose 6-phosphate. So we're taking the ATP from one molecule, the ATP, and putting the, the inorganic phosphate onto the glucose on the sixth carbon, so we get glucose 6-phosphate. We've just phosphorylated the sixth carbon of glucose. So the enzymes, why do we need them? Well, they catalyze reaction. Reactions. And what does that mean? What does it mean to catalyze a reaction? It means to start a reaction rapidly at body temperature. And really, it, it, this is specific to physiology, but we can catalyze reactions um, not at body temperature, but in other conditions. Every time you start your car, you're catalyzing a reaction. You're converting oxygen, which is a carbon-containing molecule, in the presence of, uh, I'm sorry, gasoline, which is a carbon-containing molecule, in the presence of <coughs> oxygen, into carbon dioxide and water to make that. And we're actually increasing temperature in that situation. We're not using an enzyme, we're using a spark plug to increase the temperature inside the chamber of the car to cause that reaction to occur spontaneously at whatever temperature the environment is. In the case of the human body, it's not really that good to increase temperature on a global scale. We call that fever and it makes us feel really bad. So instead of catalyzing reactions through changes in heat, we're going to catalyze reactions with enzymes. 
and we're going to start those reactions rapidly at body temperature. Now, before we get into the specifics here, I want to give you some hints. The way that we name enzymes most of the time is going to allude to what the enzyme does and what molecule the enzyme is acting upon. So we're going to talk a little bit about nomenclature. So again, within the name of an enzyme, it's naming convention. You should be able to find most frequently the substrate receiving the action. The chemical reaction or action taking place. And all enzymes will have a suffix A-S-E. Okay, so let me give you an example. And I'm going to give you an example of an enzyme, phospho fructokinase. Phospho fructokinase. We're going to do an example. Oh. And the example is phospho fructokinase. Just from that name, I can tell you a bunch of stuff about this enzyme. So let's go ahead and let's break this break this down. So phospho fructose. This is the substrate that is receiving the action. What is phospho fructose? Well, it is a fructose molecule that's already been phosphorylated once. So it's a phospho fructose. So we have fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate is what's going to be receiving the action because that is a phosphorylated fructose molecule. Now it's a kinase. And whenever we have kin, K-I-N, Anyone remember? I know that a couple of you should know this. What does a kinase do? What's a kin, K I N? Shame. Shame on all of you. That's a phosphate. Do you not remember that? <clears throat> I'm not doing my job very effectively, I guess. <laughs> Anytime you see kinase, it adds a phosphate. You can also dephosphorylate, which would be a dephosphorylase. You can change the structure without changing the chemical composition, which is going to be a submarase. So it's going to act on fructose 6-phosphate, and it's going to add another, another phosphate. I already got one phosphate on there, so I'm going to end up with two phosphates. And so what we're going to end up with here, oh, before I do that, you already all knew this. The ASC just signifies that it's an enzyme as opposed to other molecules. So we're going to take our already phosphorylated fructose, fructose 6-phosphate, we're going to add on another phosphate. And we're going to end up with fructose 1,6-biphosphate or bisphosphate. Where does that molecule show up? Glycolysis. Glucose gets converted into glucose 6-phosphate by the actions of hexokinase. 
glucose 6-phosphate gets converted into fructose 6-phosphates by the action of the isomerase, and then fructose 6 phosphate gets converted into fructose 1 6 bisphosphate by the actions of phosphofructokinase. And really, it's phosphofructokinase 1, which is the rate limiting step of glycolysis. You remember that? Vaguely? Vaguely? Good. Okay, so how exactly does a enzyme work? Well, if I draw a chemical reaction, and over here we have our substrate, and over here we have our product. If I just allowed reactions to occur spontaneously at a high rate of speed, they would occur all the time. And that would be energy demanding. We lose all kinds of, of energy. Imagine right now you go out and your car is turning itself on. The reaction is just automatically going. There is no way to turn it off. You, you just stand at the gas pump. <laughs> That would be your whole life. Fortunately, that's not the way that it works. We have this thing called activation of energy. And this is the amount of energy that we have to put in before a reaction will actually occur. So we put in some energy, and then the reaction spontaneously occurs to produce product. All right? This is a barrier. This prevents reactions. This is a principle prevents your car from always causing the gasoline to be chemically converted into oxygen or water and carbon dioxide. So we have to do what's called meet the activation of energy. We can e increase the temperature of the system, which would move our temperature of a product up here, and then the reaction would just kind of spontaneously occur. We do that in purple. <laughs> But if we globally increase the heat inside of the human body, it causes some really bad problems. So what in reality we're going to do, looks like a good color, is rather than having to meet a high energy uh, activation, activation of energy, we're going to reduce the energy activation when we put that substrate inside of the enzyme. So the enzyme is going to reduce our energy to activate, our energy needed to cause the reaction to occur spontaneously. That's going to be our activation energy. When we reduce our activation energy by putting the substrate into the enzyme, the reaction occurs spontaneously. Now, of course, we could also increase the heat, and we get the purple line, but that's not a really good way to do this. So we're going to actually reduce the energy that's required to activate. So we're not going to have as big of a hump to get over. It's not going to be as big of a barrier. Does everybody have all of this? You can hear my voice is starting to fade. <clears throat> the enzymatic process is going to have three steps. So there are three steps for or of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. And these three steps you're going to need to know them. It's going to help you along in this process. Okay, so if we have an enzyme just floating around in a cell and we have a substrate just floating around, every once in a while, and this is going to be dependent on concentration, the higher the concentration of the enzyme and the substrate, the more frequently this is going to occur. But the substrate is eventually going to be at the active site. And in fact, it's going to get into such an orientation that it's going to be very conducive to interact with the enzyme at the active site. So with the enzyme and the substrate in close contact and, and at the active site, we would have the substrate bind to, so the substrate binds up to the enzyme. 
So here what you can see is this is our active site on this hexokinase. By the way, it's a kinase, so what's it going to do? It's going to phosphorylate. It's going to add a phosphate. Glucose is just floating around, right? Hexokinase is just floating around in the cell. And every once in a while, a molecule of glucose and a molecule of hexokinase are going to interact just right. Now, how can I increase that, the rate of interaction, the, the, the probability that we're going to have that correct interaction, increase concentration of both glucose and of the enzyme, or even just of the glucose? Just go into the so I get my substrate to bind. When the substrate binds to the enzyme, this is always known as the substrate enzyme, I'm sorry, the enzyme substrate complex. So we are going to form an enzyme substrate complex. Now the thing that's really, really interesting about the enzyme substrate complex is it is very specific. We have a high level of specificity. And what that means is that one substrate binds to a specific enzyme. Glucose can bind to hexokinase. There's only a few other molecules that can actually bind to hexokinase, and they basically are different types of glucose. Phosphofructokinase, the other enzyme we just talked about, only can bind to fructose 6-phosphate. So it's very, very specific. It's so specific that we give it the name lock and key. Just like one type of key fits one type of lock, one type of substrate is going to fit one type of enzyme. So we would call this a lock and key mechanism. Now, Whenever a protein is bound by something else, that protein responds by changing its shape. Whenever you change the shape of a protein, you change the protein's function. So when the enzyme substrate complex forms, that is something binding up to a protein. The protein or the enzyme, which is a protein, is going to change its shape. And when it changes its shape, it induces the reaction to occur. Now, in changing that shape, our substrate becomes product. So the substrate becomes product. This is the this is the uh, third step. So the substrates at the active site form the enzyme substrate complex, then the reaction occurs. Substrate is converted into product. Now, the enzyme is going to change, ch change shape just, just slightly. And when, when it changes shape, there's a variety of things that will happen, or can happen, I guess I should say. So for a reaction to occur, I may actually need to stress the bonds. And so I may actually, in the active site, I will actually stretch the bonds that are uh, that, that I'm trying to break that bond that I'm trying to break. I will I will physically manipulate it to stress it, or I might put that bond into an acidic pocket. When the enzyme changes its shape, it causes that bond to get pushed into an acidic po acidic pocket. Whatever the case, what's happening is we're reducing the likelihood for that uh, for that uh, reaction to occur, or actually really we're, we're reducing the activation energy, which is increasing the likelihood for the reaction to occur. If I stress the bond, it's more likely to break. If I put that bond into an uh, acidic pocket, it's more likely to break. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to break a bond and reform a bond, or even just break the bond to release two new substrates. Okay? So the reaction occurs, and the substrate gets converted in the product. Now, this is very important. And this is the rule 99.9% .9 of the time. When the product is released,
the enzyme slips back into its original conformation completely unchanged. So an enzyme almost always is not going to change. And so what that means is that enzyme can catalyzes the reaction, releases the reactant, releases the product, and is ready, goes back into its native conformation, is ready to bind into another substrate. Now I said 99.9% .9 of the time. There are just a handful of examples of enzymes that are called suicide enzymes. And they get used just one time. They catalyze one reaction and they don't revert back to their original to their original shape. That word right there is supposed to be more change. All right, cliffhanger for tonight. We will talk about what happens to enzymes when they get put into higher temperatures or higher pHs or in presence of cofactors and coenzymes next Monday.